Ephesians 2 verse 1, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sin in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath, but because of his great love for us, God who is rich in mercy, because of his great love for us, God who is rich in mercy, I'm going to say it again, but because of his great love for us, God who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ Jesus, even when we were dead in transgression. It is by amazing grace that you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming days or ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. The title of my sermon this morning it is, is, is said, for it is only by grace. It is only by grace. Or another way that we could say it is all about grace. In John 3, we read where Jesus had an appointment with a Pharisee called Nicodemus. Whoever scheduled the meeting, scheduled the meeting for night time. Nicodemus was a member of the Jewish religious council. So it was appropriate for Nicodemus to go to Jesus under the cover of night rather than to be meeting Jesus in public lest his other council members think that he was going to switch sides. So here is Nicodemus in this private meeting with Jesus. And Jesus looked at him and he said, Very truly I say unto you, if you want to enter the kingdom of God, you must be born again. Nicodemus was no idiot. And what just came out of Jesus' mouth made no sense. Nicodemus turned to Jesus and said, Explain to me what you mean when you say, I must be born again. Nobody is born twice. Nobody can go back into their mother's womb and be born again. So when you say to me, I must be born again, clear up that matter for me because it makes no sense. Jesus looked at Nicodemus and he said to him, flesh gives birth to flesh. Spirit gives birth to spirit. Marvel not that I say unto you, you must be born again. You see, Jesus was talking to somebody who was dead. Except the dead man did not know that he was dead. Incidentally, you know when some people have lost relatives and they're talking to their relatives, dead people cannot communicate. Stop it. Nicodemus was dead and he did not know it. So when Jesus was speaking... 
It was a living man who was hearing the words that Jesus said. But Jesus was talking to a dead Nicodemus. So you might be wondering, how comes I arrive at that? Thank you so much for asking. Jesus is no fool. So when Jesus said, you must be born again, Jesus is coming from the place where he knows that Nicodemus is dead. How was Nicodemus dead? In Genesis chapter 2, God said to the first human being, you can eat of any fruit in this garden, but of the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden, you must not eat. Because in the day that you eat of that fruit, you shall surely die. What did that mean that they will surely die? Come over with me to chapter 3 of Genesis. That one day, the female person in the garden had a conversation with a serpent. Ladies, don't let anybody catch you talking to snakes. <laughs> Eve was having a full-blown conversation with a serpent. And the serpent convinced her or can I use the colloquial word? The serpent conned her into believing what he was saying. That he was quoting half of what God said to her and twisting the other half. The Bible said that he conned her sufficiently enough that she, listen to this now, she took off the fruit. And she ate it. And she gave it to her husband. And the two of them ate it. Oh, hold on. But Jesus, God had said to them in chapter 2, The day you eat of the fruit, you shall surely die. All right. Let's go even further back to Genesis 1. Because you and I who know the story in Genesis 3, you know that when Eve ate the apple, or the fruit rather, sorry for those who love apples, and when Adam ate a piece of the same fruit, they did not tumble over and die. So did God lie? Did God con them into believing that they were going to die? In Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, the Bible said, God said, let us make man in our own image and in our own likeness. Put that down for a while. When he was finished making them, he said to them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. When God said to God, the Father, God, the Son, God, the Holy Spirit had that conversation. And he said, let us make man in our own image. Listen, God formed man out of the dust of the earth. That was the body. God breathed into man the breath of life. That was the soul. But God put something inside of man called spirit. Spirit and spirit have two forms. Spirit is either dead or alive. So when God said to Adam and Eve, who are now body, soul, and spirit, when God said, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth, catch this now. When he said, be fruitful, what he was saying to Adam and Eve is that there is something inside of you called spirit. And you are going to pass on spirit to every child that is born. But when he said multiply, he said, Adam and Eve, get busy. Start having children. How did I arrive at that? Because the Bible teaches us in the New Testament that when we lead people to Jesus, that we are bearing fruit for the kingdom. When we have children, 
we are multiplying. God gave Adam and Eve a double-barreled assignment. Be fruitful. And every fruit that you bring into the world will have the spirit that I have put inside of you. Multiply. Have children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren all the way down to our present day and age. What was going on? The spirit that God placed in Adam and Eve was the portion of their tripartite being that was to be in relationship with God. Hmm. Don't sit down there like you don't understand. God is a spirit. And God said, Adam and Eve, when I am in relationship with you, it is not so much about your body and your soul. It is about your spirit. Me, my spirit, and your spirit are going to be like this. The day that you eat of the fruit that I tell you not to eat, your spirit is going to be disconnected from my spirit. Your spirit is going to die. So that is why when we come to chapter 3, when they ate of the fruit, this did not die. This stood up same way. As a matter of fact, this got smart. And this realized that this was naked and put on clothes made of fig leaves. When God turned up and said, where is the spirit man called Adam? Where is the spirit woman called Eve? We heard your voice in the garden and we were hiding. You didn't hide yesterday. You didn't hide last week. How comes you're hiding now? Who told you what they told you so that you know that you are naked? When Adam and Eve sinned, their spirit died. Their spirit ceased to have relationship with God. And Romans 5 and verse 12 says, Wherefore as by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin, wherefore death has been passed upon all men because all have sinned. Translated to mean that every human being who was going to be born after that was born in the flesh but still born in the spirit or oh, you don't get what I'm saying that Jesus that God was saying that when we are born because we came from Adam's lineage a part of us was born the part that blows breath a part of us was born the soul which has emotions and think and feel and makes decision but a critical part of us called the spirit Spirit was still born. It was not born alive. So when Jesus looked on Nicodemus and said, My friend, you must be born again. What Jesus was saying to Nicodemus is that there is a part of you called your spirit, which right now at this age in your life, it is dead. Very dead. And in order for you to get into the kingdom of God, in order for you, Nicodemus, to go to heaven, you must be born again. Your spirit man, which is dead, must be born again. So now, here comes Paul. Pick up the same argument. And Paul says, all of you at Ephesus and Faith Place Church who hear this scripture being read, I want to tell you that you were dead in your trespasses and sins. There was a time when your spirit man was not in relationship with God. He goes on now to help us to understand what he means when he said that we were dead in sin. And in our trespasses. Because he said that you used to live 
when you follow the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. You catch this? Listen carefully now. Paul said, before you experience salvation, you came under the curse that was on Adam and Eve. You were born dead. And if you were born dead, it means that you used to live in a dead way following after the patterns of this world that was dictated to you not just by the world, but the ruler of the air, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience. Who, 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 slow down, Clyde. God is a spirit. Man has a spirit. But we now see in verse 2 that Satan is a spirit. So when Eve was talking to the serpent, that was the disguise. Inside the spirit, this, the serpent was the spirit of Satan leading her to disobey God. Just remember this. When Satan is coming to tempt us, he doesn't come as Satan. Did you hear what I said? That Satan knows that you know what he looks like. He is not coming in bodily form. He is coming in his spirit form. So he came to Eve in the form of a serpent. The garden had serpent. So Eve was not a stranger to a serpent. What poor Eve did not remember is that serpents do not talk. And that's how Satan cons us into committing sin. He comes in the form of something that we might recognize. That Peter says that he goes around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. That he goes around like the angel of light. Satan is not revealing himself as a spirit who rules the air and misleads people into disobedience with God. So Paul is helping us to understand that the spirit of Satan is messing with us at the spirit level. What does that mean? Romans 6 tells us that when we were not Christians, we were slaves to sin. Slaves to sin. Because look what happened. The first two slaves he got were Adam and Eve. Yes. And Satan knew that God had said, if you sin, you shall surely die. So Satan now thought that he had won the battle. Every human being who is born into this world, their spirit is dead, which means that now they are going to become slaves to sin. So when Paul says to you, don't feel bad and embarrassed and think that Paul is being out of order. Paul is speaking truth that you know. That he is saying that your spirit man was so dead that you then became a slave to sin. And look what the slave to sin did. Verse 3. All of us lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. The cravings of our flesh. I want to think that since Satan has seen to it that the spirit man dies, now he comes to the soul and the body and he makes temptations attractive, so attractive that this called flesh desires it. This called flesh wants it. This called flesh does it. 
that he communicates to us in temptation form to our souls to make the soul start to think, Brother Keith, that when he waves something in front... Listen, when he said to Eve that she will not surely die, verse 6 of chapter 3 of Genesis said, when the woman looked, 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 what you looked, what you used to look, your eyes, flesh, cravings of the flesh. When the woman looked at the fruit and she saw that it was desirable, what kind of a nonsense is this? Eve, you never eat that fruit before. So how come your 2020 vision tells you that the fruit is delicious? If you don't have any sense. When you look at some things and it look nice, think carefully because it's only the looks part of it is nice. Eve looked at the fruit and she saw, she not tasted it now. She saw that the fruit was good to the taste and that it was good to make you wise. My goodness, Donovan might can explain it, but I don't know how Eve figured it out that looking on a fruit is going to make her wise. She don't touch the fruit yet. That is the spirit of Satan who works in us. That when he tempts us, he makes us... He, <coughs> He messes up our mind in such a way that we start to look on the sin that we don't commit yet. And he makes the eyes think that the sin that you're going to, about to, planning to commit, that it is nice to the body. You all know what I'm talking about. And as far as God is concerned, the sin now becomes a craving of this. You know what I'm talking about? That every sin that we commit, the body craves for it. The body says, you want some of this. You want this. You want the benefit of this. And when the benefit runs out, you need to get some more. Oh, we were slaves to sin. Paul says that in that capacity, that we were led away according to the cravings of the flesh and the thoughts that were in our heads, soul and body messed up because he already has the spirit dead. And the last line in that verse says, and we were all by nature deserving of God's wrath. Not because of the size of the sins, not because of the numerous sins that you committed, but simply because you had become a slave to sin, because your spirit man is disobedient, your spirit man is dead, that we were deserving of the wrath of God. What is the wrath of God? Death. Death. But look now. Like the rest we... Okay. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgress. It is by grace you have been saved. <coughs> Jesus said to Nicodemus, if you want to enter the kingdom of heaven, you must be born again. How can you be born again? Who? Paul gives us three words. And we're going to camp out on three words. In order, Paul says, love, mercy, grace. Love, mercy, grace. Let's look at it. He says that God, because of his great love for us. You know now, you're now going to understand in a fresh way. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Listen, that when God made man in his image and in his likeness, God loved man. When man committed the sin of disobedience in Genesis 3, God loved man. 
For thousands of years, God loved man. And God said, listen, I have to do something about this love that I have for my creation. My love for my creation. I cannot just stay up in heaven and say that I love you. I love you. I love you. While Satan is down there running roughshod over them. The Bible says in 1 John 4 and verse 8, God is love. And so because God is love, love could not keep quiet. Can I just for a moment call him love? Love sat on his throne and love could not keep still because love missed the relationship that he once had with human beings. And love said, I have got to do something about this love that I have for human beings. For God so loved the world that he gave. You see a homeless person on the road. You see somebody who you went to college with falling down on their luck, and they are struggling in life, and you tell the person, I love you. And they're saying, show it. Show it. Because it is not good enough for you, God, to stay up in heaven and say that you are love and that you love us. Show it. And God said, you want me to show it? First John 4 and verse 9 says... That hearing is how God demonstrated his love for us. That while we were yet sinners, the son that he gave died for us. Which brings me to word number two. Mercy. Mercy. The Bible says that God is full of mercy. Let me tell you about mercy. Mercy has two sides. Mercy has a side which says you deserve to be punished because of what you did. The other side of mercy says, I am going to show you compassion. I'm going to have mercy on you. When Jesus was born on that first Christmas morn, that was God showing mercy to the world. All we like sheep had turned everyone to his own way. But the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Jesus did not come to earth on a vacation from heaven. Jesus did not come to earth on a field trip to see how the earth looked. Jesus did not come to earth to hang out with 12 Jewish boys and have a nice time in three years. Jesus was the living version of God's mercy, God's compassion. He said that he gave his only begotten son, that the son would become the sacrifice to bring human beings back to life. There's a song which says, mercy said no. I'm not going to let you go. I'm not going to let you slip away. Praise God. Mercy said no. When Jesus came in mercy, Jesus saw every one of us in our sin and in our shame and in our transgressions. The song says, my chains are gone. Jesus, in his mercy, looked at us and saw that we were chained by sin. Jesus saw that we were slaves to sin, where Satan was bossing us around to do things that God did not intend us to do. And his mercy said, no! Enough is enough, Satan. You have messed up my creation for a long time. No mercy is stepping in. I am going to break the chains that bind them. I am going to open the prison doors that have them locked away. I am going to give them anyone who believes on him should not perish but have everlasting life. Mercy said no. My goodness, I don't know about you, 
but I thank God for love and I thank God for mercy. Because if, <laughs> if God had said, all of them who are sinners, let them go to hell. I mean, literally. God wasn't cursing. God could have said, because you sinned against me, that I'm going to send all of you to hell, which you deserve to go to. If God had shipped us all off to hell, the wages of sin is death. If God had given us our just wages, there is no angel in heaven who could look at God and say, you're wicked, eh? Because that is what we deserve. But mercy said no. Brings me now to word number three. And if I don't finish that word, you will understand. Tangela, amazing grace. How sweet the sound. The Bible said that God showed us his grace when he redeemed us. It is right there. It is by grace you have been saved. My goodness, you know what grace is? Grace is God coming to where we were. And he says to us, you Clyde, you deserve to go to hell, but grace is here to save you. Grace is here to save you. Take my hand. And let me take you out of sin. Grace is God's unmerited favor to sinners like me. I don't know about you, but had it not been for grace, had it not been for grace, you wouldn't have had me for a husband. Had it not been for grace, I would not be on this platform today. Don't look at me as if you don't understand what I'm saying. Had it not been for the grace of God, some of us would have been out there in prison, in the garbage bin, out there in some place that no decent person would find you. Some of us, our character would be like dirt. But amazing grace. Amazing grace found me. That's why John Newton wrote this song, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound. The, the, the most honest part of that song is the next line, that saved a wretch like me. John Newton was not a nice person. He was the captain of a slave ship. Almost every island in the Caribbean had people in those countries who hated John Newton. And here he is one day he met Jesus. And he said, your amazing grace saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. When I get to heaven... I have one thing to say to John Newton. Beautiful song, nice song. Tangela, sing it good. Everybody sing it good. The American military, they play it at all their colleagues' funerals, blah, 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 and so forth. John Newton, you left out a line. I once was lost, now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. You have to put in the line that speaks about me. I once was dead. But now I'm alive in Christ Jesus because of amazing grace. I am not ashamed to say that God's amazing grace found me where I was, rescued me, and gave me what John 3.16 said, eternal life. Because Satan had robbed me and all of you from the eternal life that God gave Adam and Eve. And grace said, it is now time for you to come back into what you were given. That's why it is called redemption. 
But look at grace. Look at grace. Because now remember, it's not the body that, saved, that was saved. No, 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 no. It's a spirit. So look at what verse 6 says. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. What part of me is raised up? My spirit. Because now my spirit is back in relationship with God. And God said, listen, Clyde, I'm going to bring your spirit into the heavenly realms to sit down with me. And we can talk and commune. So listen, when I commit a sin, I am interrupting the communication between me and Jesus. Because I am supposed to be seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Verse 7 says that in the ages to come, we might show forth the incomparable riches of his grace. Did I say that God used three words? Love, mercy, and grace. But verse 8 says that we used one word. It took God love, mercy, and grace to save us. And what did we have to do? Faith. For those of you who don't get it, listen. When, 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 when Jesus said to Nicodemus, you must be born again. And Nicodemus, with his little first grade biology, said that you expect this grown man to go back into my mother's womb and be born again. And Jesus wanted to say to him, you're an idiot. You think I am an idiot? If there's any idiot here, it's you, not me. Right? And so forth. But Jesus didn't say those words. Because what Jesus was talking to Nicodemus on was on spirit level. Nicodemus was talking to Jesus on flesh level. Jesus said, you're missing the point if that is where you're talking. I am talking about something more important. This flesh, when it dies, it would be buried. But this is the part of you that I'm after. The part of you that must experience eternal life. Nicodemus, shut your mouth and listen to me. If you want to be a part of God's kingdom, them. Your spirit must be born. When your spirit is born, Nicodemus, when you accept my salvation of grace, you will receive that thing called eternal life. So that Nicodemus, this thing that you treasure so much, when this dies and it is buried anywhere they want to bury it, your spirit, man, will continue to live forever because I give you eternal life. For by grace are we saved through faith. Nicodemus, do you have the faith to do what John 3.16 says? Whosoever believes on him should not perish but have everlasting life. Nicodemus, this you're looking at is mercy, offering you grace. You might not understand it now, Nicodemus, but do you have faith enough to make a decision that you will accept Jesus as your Savior so that you can receive the gift of eternal life? For by grace are we saved through faith. You come to Calvary with your sin burden. You come to Calvary with your sad story. You come to Calvary with your dead spirit. And you tell Jesus you want to be saved. And Jesus says, faith. Two rascals were crucified the day with Jesus. I use rascal because I can't use the other words inside here. <clears throat> the one on the right side, the rascal on the right side, he saw love, he saw mercy, he saw grace, but he lacked faith. That he was functioning at the flesh level, saying to Jesus, Jesus, if you claim that you are the Son of God, Imagine you talking to love, mercy, and grace like that. 
And he said, if you claim who you are to be, if that is true, come down off the cross. Do another magic. Do another Disney World act. And just pull off yourself off the cross. Rip out the nails out of your hand and your feet and so forth. And come over here and save me. For by grace are we saved, what? Through faith. The other rascal on the other side said, bro, you don't get it. You don't get it. Love, mercy, and grace is on the middle cross. And he is saying to us that you can be saved if you exercise faith. And so after rascal number two spoke a rebuke to rascal number one, he then turned to love, mercy, and grace. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into... Oh, hold on. You saw what I, you saw what I did? I knocked my chest, but he could knock my chest. His hands were dead to the cross, right? So he must have did this. Remember me. Right? When you come into your kingdom. Jesus, I have faith. And I believe that you are love, mercy, and grace. Remember me. And Jesus said, young man, this day you will receive the gift of eternal life. You will be with me in paradise. I want to land this plane. Somebody is here today who needed to hear this message. Somebody is here today who needs to experience love, mercy, and grace. I can't help but get excited about grace because if it had not been for grace the songwriter says grace that is greater than all my sin I cannot help get excited about grace because wonderful grace of Jesus is greater than all my sin how can my tongue describe it? Where shall its praise begin? It took away my burden, set my spirit free, and the wonderful grace of Jesus reached me. Every child of God can say those words and more, that the wonderful grace of Jesus reached me found me, cleansed me, and gave me eternal life. But if you are here today and you don't know Jesus as your Savior, you are in the same position that Nicodemus was in. You are in the same position that I was in. You are in the same position that many of the people in here were. You are still dead in your trespasses and in your sins. But today, today, love, mercy, and grace is here. Love, mercy, and grace is here. And Jesus is speaking to you, whoever you are. And he says, listen, it is not about becoming a member of Faith Place Church. It is about accepting the gift of eternal life. It is about saying to me, Jesus, I believe in you. Come into 